Um, we are joined by Kevin Williamson, National Review contributor, author of the brand new book, The End is Near, and it's going to be awesome. How going broke will leave America richer, happier, and more secure. Here it is, and here is Kevin. Kevin, welcome. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Um, move that a little bit closer to you, and we'll be all set. Okay, um, first of all, um, did you see any of the hearings today? I didn't see a lot of them. Unfortunately, a lot of other stuff going on today, but the, uh, the whole thing uh, with the IRS is just extraordinarily troubling, regardless of whether it goes back to the White House. Well, yeah, and, uh, but it, it, there is a story that, um, it, that, that's come out because of testimony today. Uh, the uh, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration testified and told members of the Ways and Means that he informed the Treasury's General Counsel of his audit on June 4th, um, and, and, and this goes back to uh, 2012, um, so the Treasury Department Inspector General said that he was uh, auditing the IRS's screening of politically active organizations, told the Treasury back in uh, June of 2012. I mean, it, it gets more and more unlikely, harder to believe that, that the administration, that the president did not know this was going on until last Friday. Yeah, that's really the unbelievable thing about this is all the leadership says they didn't know about it, but everyone's lawyers knew about it. Everyone's general counsel, everyone's senior counsel was getting reports on this, was having meetings about it, you know, changing the standards, changing the wording, that sort of thing. So I find it really, really unlikely that the commissioner of the IRS didn't know it, that people at senior in the Treasury Department didn't know it. Now, I'd be surprised to see if any of this was being directed by the president personally or anyone in his immediate circle because they just don't do that sort of thing. It's like when you're at the top of an organized crime syndicate, you know, you never touch drugs or money. I love, I love I love the analogy. <laughs> but there are people who do it on your behalf. Right, but, but you know that it's going on. I mean, you know that your organization, your syndicate is involved in drugs and, 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 and crime and all that kind of stuff. You may not make the decisions. You may not be told. You know, you may not be. They may insulate you so that you can never be fingered or never be culpable legally. But you know that it's go that's happening because you're ahead of the crime syndicate. Right. In a sense, it's more troubling if no one told the IRS to do this because they didn't really have to be told to do it. Just targeting people who belong to Tea Party groups, targeting people who care about the Bill of Rights or Constitution, just apparently sort of comes naturally to them, whether anyone above them was telling them to do it or not. Yeah. A very troubling day because we had Stephen Miller say that uh, it, it, when asked directly if targeting of uh, individuals and groups is against the law, he said uh, he he doesn't believe it's against the law. Uh, he had no information when it came to who did who okayed this, who who put it in motion, who were there. Give us names, names. He had no names. Um, he did apologize, but he's very arrogant. Basically, basically, as a nice segue into your book, said. You know, we need more funding at the IRS yeah, exactly. because our guys are overworked. And this is really a, this was a time saver. This was a code words were instituted to look for to to save time to help us shuffle through and get through all the um, you know the thousands of applications. So so here again, he, he's using this as a as, as a as a, um, a a pitch for more money. Talk right. about what you talk about in your book. Um, I love the the title is brilliant. The end is near, and it's going to be awesome. Well, if you look at the um the debt, the uh, deficits, the unfunded liabilities of the federal, state, and local governments, you add them all up, you get a number that looks around $140 trillion, which is about two times the GDP of the planet. It's pressing up against the value of all the financial assets in the world. So everyone knows that our current trajectory is not sustainable. Democrats know it, Republicans know it, Libertarians know it, the CBO knows it, everyone knows it. So the current trajectory we're on is not going to be where we are in a few years. The promises we've made for things like Social Security, Medicare just simply aren't going to be paid. One of the reasons I worry less about Obamacare than a lot of people do is I don't think it'll ever actually be implemented fully because we simply don't have the money for it. So the question we need to be asking ourselves, I think, as conservatives, as free market people, is once these programs go away, which they're going to because the money just simply is not there, what do we do to address those problems after that? Because, you know, there's always going to be a problem with how do we take care of health care for very poor people? How do we take care of education. We don't really expect kids to be financially responsible for themselves. We've got some real social problems and social challenges that we need to address that the welfare state isn't doing a very good job of addressing. So this book is in part about how we go about thinking about how to solve those problems. Well, let's talk about Obamacare for a second. Uh, on a political note, uh, the, the woman who was in charge of the uh, <laughs> the tax-exempt groups, not only is she, she's gotten herself a promotion. Yeah. She is going to be the one. She is in charge of the department of the IRS that will be he, will be responsible for implementing Obamacare. Uh, that that's one problem. But you know, you talk about it not being uh, being able to be fully impl implemented. 
it's just already caused so much chaos. It's got doctors you know, ready to leave, and they're leaving. It's got hospitals revamping. It's got uh, the, the premiums going up. It's got employers not hiring. I mean, it's already created such a chaotic scene that whether it's fully implemented or not, they're saying next year, one congressional report said that, uh, that the premiums could go up next year Two, three, four hundred percent. Yeah. How are we? How's this country going to deal with that? Yeah, and it's one of the things I, I get into in the book is this you know, traditional Washington approach of taking a one-size-fits-all, one big piece of legislation and solving, as they say, something really complex like health care doesn't introduce order into the marketplace. It introduces chaos. It introduces a great deal of uncertainty. And Obamacare is a classic Washington example of that, where you take a very vague piece of legislation, you hand it over to the bureaucrats to develop the regulations to implement it, and nobody knows which way they're going with it. It's what political scientists call regime uncertainty. You don't know what sort of environment you're going to be operating in, what the regulations are going to look like, what the taxes are going to look like, what the laws are going to look like. And so nobody can make intelligent investment decisions from there, whether it's a company deciding to develop a line of medical products or someone deciding whether to go to med school. Oh, and, yeah, and this has yeah. been the case right from the time that they were talking about Obamacare, thinking it would be implemented. And then once it was passed, th that has been the mindset in, in, for, for business owners, large and small, Uncertainty. Uncertainty is an, is an economic killer. Yeah. And, uh, and it's especially troubling because the whole th problem with our approach to these sorts of things is throwing government appropriations at a particular set of problems without paying any attention to the supply side of the equation. So you can spend a trillion dollars on health care next year. You can spend 50 trillion, whatever you want to. If there are only so many doctors, so many hospital beds, so many factories making artificial hips, so many factories making pharmaceuticals, all you're going to get is inflation. All you're going to get is a bigger pool of money chasing the same supply of goods and services. What we need to do is encourage real investment in real medical assets, whether those are factories, hospitals, or young people going into careers in medicine. And instead, we're discouraging all of that. Absolutely. We're talking uh, right now to Kevin uh, Williamson from National Review and his uh, book, The End is Near, and it's going to be awesome. Um, how going broke will leave America richer, happier, and more secure. Um, you know, we, we've all heard about uh, the doomsday scenario that we're going to, we're, we're going to become Greece. Mm. Uh, we're going to become, you know, these countries that are going bankrupt. And, um, you know, the, the next thing they'll come after are our, our pensions. And uh, you hear about proposals that might, you know, that, that are on the table that are floating around Congress that, um, you know, IRAs, we should, the government should be able to borrow against them, et cetera. So, uh, where where does it go before it gets better? In other words, how much more of a downside is there if we were to continue? In a, I mean, the, you know, the market is running uh, in the other direction of, of, from the economy, even though numbers look better jobs-wise and all. Still, I know, and you know, I believe, that you would agree with me. I can't only put words in your mouth that unemployment's down because people are leaving the workforce. Right. And there's a l less of participation rate than there's been in decades. So the numbers and the trends are all going worse, um, housing starts, you know, fluctuate. But the, my point is, and my question, I guess, is, are we still headed in, you know, distractions notwithstanding, are we still headed in that, you know, Greece direction? And w w can we wind up there before it gets better? Yeah, the labor force thing is particularly troubling. We have fewer people working today than any time since Jimmy Carter was president. I'm just barely old enough to remember Jimmy Carter being yeah, president. Say, don't remind me that I'm he was 40, president. You know? yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not like it was the day before yesterday. Um, what is coming economically for us is going to come regardless of who's in the White House, who's in Congress, uh, and what they do. The, the trouble that we have is baked into the cake, and there's no way to undo it. Now, we can either go into this process in an intelligent way, start doing some reforms now to make it less painful and less economically and socially disruptive, or we can keep doing what we're doing and go into it and have a quick, ugly, deep crisis. In which case, you know, Greece isn't even the worst case scenario. You've got, you know, places like Cyprus and Argentina yeah. that give you pretty good models of what you can do with that. So at some point, our government's ability to borrow money is limited by reality, not by the statutory debt ceiling, but by the real debt ceiling of what people are willing to do. And you don't want to discover in a very quick way where that is, where you have a bond auction and no one buys them. Right. And then you've got you know, an immediate fiscal problem, an immediate monetary problem. When China turns off the, uh, the faucet, in, in effect. Yeah, well, and that's a really worrisome thing to me because you know, the Chinese economy is not nearly as strong as we think it is. It's, it's not a house of cards, but it's definitely got some, some really troubling aspects to it. They've got 
uh, their own real estate boom. They've got a banking system that's got all sorts of bad assets on the thing. So if China takes a real bad downturn, that's, you know, that's a real issue for us. We are linked together in a way that nobody likes very much, but is, is the way it is. Let's talk about immigration and uh, <laughs> how that affects your scenario in the sure. book and, and, the, and the future of this country. Um, <clears throat> if it passes, and I, you know, I was speaking to, uh, to Senator Corker today, and he said that the, all these scandals certainly will make people look even harder at, at, at any kind of a, a administration effort to get anything done. Uh, and I hope that's true with immigration. Um, uh, but it, it, if it if it passes, if some kind of reform passes, and you got, um, you know, the predictions are tens of millions of people coming into this country over the next decade, could be 20 million, 30 million, if family members are invited, et cetera. High-end workers, uh, high, skilled workers will be invited, and low-end workers will be invited. And we already have people who don't work now in this country. Um, does that contribute to the um, – to, 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 does that expedite your scenario, or does that uh, uh, throw a monkey wrench into it, or what? No, you know, this is a, a, a classic example of what I'm talking about in the book, is we often spend a lot of time talking about what government should do, but we don't often ask what it can do. We have perfectly good immigration laws, but they don't get enforced. Right. So federal incompetence means that instead of having 15 or 16 or 17 million new immigrants who are people with MBAs and engineering degrees and doctors and highly skilled, highly educated very, very economically valuable people. We've got 15 million people who are farm workers and dishwashers and, you know, very poor, very unskilled people from Latin America. I don't resent them for coming here. If I was in their spot, I would do exactly the same thing. But a country has to tell itself, well, we, d we can't take every immigrant in the world, so what criteria do we use to accept them instead of doing it on an economic basis, which would be rational and reasonable and also more fair? You know, we've got educated and capable people from all over the world, from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America and Europe and everywhere else. And if you do that, you have some real economic criteria, real skills and education criteria, then you make it a reasonably fair process. Instead, we make it impossible for smart, highly educated people to come here. We make it really easy for people who are willing to break the law to come here, so we end up getting the worst of both worlds. I'm generally very pro-immigration, and I think it's one piece of the puzzle for fixing the situation we're in. But what we're doing right now in immigration is absolutely counterproductive. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, okay, uh, before we let you go, Kevin, uh, you had a little incident in uh, in a theater uh, attending a, a, a performance of uh, uh, Natasha Pierre and the Great Comedy of 1812, um, and you, you, you wound up taking someone's cell phone and throwing it? I did. Yeah, you know, this is funny. Never mind the books I've written and my work at National Review. <laughs> this has got, now you're worldwide famous. This, yeah. this is what the world is going to know me for, apparently. So I am the theater critic at the New Criterion, and I was at a play the other night. It's actually an opera. <laughs> Uh, it's about a two-and-a-half-hour opera based on war and peace. Not the place to be if you have a short attention span. <laughs> so there was a lady sitting next to me who was just on her phone the whole time. You know, we complained to the management about it during the intermission, but it, it didn't help. So I, I asked her very politely to knock it off because, you know, it's a darkened theater and a bright phone and all the rest of it. And Plus uh, she's talking. Who the heck wants to well, hear yeah, someone else and talking? You're talking yeah. to her friends. Yeah. She wasn't actually talking on the phone. She was texting while talking to her oh, friends okay. in the theater, That's which even was worse. even worse. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so she said, well, if you don't like it, look somewhere else. And I was thinking, well, you know, I would actually, except that this is bright light shining in my face. So anyway, when she, it became clear she wasn't going to comply, I, I took the phone away from her. And I tossed it into the wings. I was aiming for a door. I was trying to throw it out the door. I didn't actually hit the door. I'm not a very good shot, apparently. So uh, it became this whole. Uh, so what happened to you? What, what, what oh, was well, the result yeah, the of funny that? The thing was, she did her husband up, like get up and slug you? Did was uh, she... there was no husband there? Okay, um, <laughs> that's always but good. She, but she stood up and slugged me. Well, she slapped me anyway. But then uh, the theater, the way this particular play was going on, it's not a uh, the uh, the actors aren't on a stage. They're sort of in the middle of the venue. So she got up and marched out through the middle of the production, <laughs> uh, which apparently a number of people thought was part of the show, <laughs> and uh, you know opened the doors behind her. So eventually they kicked me out. And, I was going to uh, say, what about her phone? Are you going to have to pay for it or anything? Uh, well, I haven't heard anything about that yet. Uh, apparently, uh, she was talking to someone, in the, the manager there, about you know calling the police and filing charges. Uh, I haven't been hauled off yet, but i just like to say if I am, <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> It will have been worth it. Oh, boy. Well, listen, uh, great, best of luck with the book. Kevin Williamson will read you on National Review. And the book, The End is Near, folks, available wherever fine books are, are sold, uh, Amazon and all the bookstores, et cetera. And um, very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much.